excited to have David Thompson here today. And we came up with names and names and names of people we thought would be good to have come to give this address at the end of our 75th year. And Terry kept saying, David Thompson, David Thompson, David Thompson. So I give you Terry to introduce the reason why David Thompson is here and why we're so thrilled to have him. I am excited to have David here. Um, and the, the reason that I'm especially excited today to have David here is that 75 years ago today, Toyohiko Kagawa came to Hamper through an invitation of the president of the newly formed Hanover Consumer Club, uh, Reverend Roy Chamberlain, who invited Kagawa to come and speak at the White Church <clears throat> at 11 o'clock in the morning to uh, area clergy people. Later in the afternoon, at about 2, in Dartmouth Hall, Kagawa spoke to the public and especially to the members of the Consumer Club. I am honored uh, to uh, uh, make this introduction uh, on the anniversary of Kagawa's speech because I can think of no one more appropriate to make the speech than David Thompson, who uh, has studied Kagawa and uh, the Japanese cooperative societies and cooperatives in general. David is a true cooperator. Uh, he was born near Rochdale and never let the spirit of the Rochdale pioneers leave his thinking. Um, uh, he has a wide-ranging knowledge of cooperatives. He is a uh, founder of a co-op, he's a member of the Co-op Hall of Fame, and he is a friend of all cooperatives, <coughs> and, uh, and a special friend of the Hanover Co-op. So I introduce David Thompson. <laughs> Well, good morning and thank you very much for that lovely welcome from uh, both your president and from Terry. Uh, Terry, is, uh, you're very fortunate to have Terry here as your general manager because he's such a wonderful, wonderful person and is a good manager and a great cooperator. And, you know, not, 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 not easy to find both of those things. Um, before I, I, I go into it, you're supposed to always sort of start speeches with a, a joke. Right. Uh, so I only know co-op jokes. <laughs> so here it goes. Now this is a true story. Um, about five years ago, I was uh, with my cousin, uh, not far from Rochdale. We'd gone to Haworth, where the Bronte sisters are, and I wanted to find out, was there a co-op where the Bronte sisters had shopped at? You know, because I'm always looking for literary connections to cooperatives. And in Howard, there's a beautiful co-op. Um, and on the way back from there, um, I had an address that I had found going on to one of the Google sites of another small co-op in this little hamlet on the Yorkshire Moors in the middle of nowhere. Um, but it was on a street called Co-op Terrace. So I stop in this little hamlet, and I find Co-op Terrace, and there's maybe 20 houses in this hamlet. And, uh, I, and I see where the store was once, now it's uh, sort of, you know, uh, somebody's living in it. Um, <clears throat> but there's nobody at the house when I knock on the door, so I go 
next door, and I knock on the door. Now it's about nine o'clock at night, it's very dark, it's February, um, um, and, and Yorkshire people are very dour, you know, and so I knock on the door, and the fellow opens up, he said, Leo, what's up? And I said, well, I said, uh, I'm from America, so I don't know that. <laughs> I said, I'm looking for the coffee soup next door. I said, I, I, I know it's next door, and, and there's nobody there, and nobody there to answer it. He said, well, he said, I've, got, I've not got much time. Come on, what, what do you want? <laughs> so, you know, by now I'm like, eh. you know. so, so, I said, well, I said, um, um, uh, the co-op was founded a long time ago, and I'm, I'm interested in learning when did it close. He said, it closed every Wednesday at 1 o'clock. <laughs> I decided then that I really couldn't pursue the interview with that gentleman. <laughs> my memory of Yorkshire people is still the same as it was when I was growing up in Lancashire. And so that's why we have the War of the Roses. So anyhow, I never found out when the co-op closed. But don't go there on Wednesday. <laughs> All right. So um, outside, um, there are books for sale. Uh, these are on. Uh, on uh, Abe's books for $43 uh, as the lowest one because they're out of print. They're here for $30. And $15 of every book that's purchased today will go to the Cooperative Development Foundation uh, for their fund that they are developing to uh, help rebuild the cooperatives in, uh, in the Sendai province that have been terribly, terribly harmed by the, uh, by the earthquake, etc. So if you if you have $30 and want to help out, please do that. Okay. So, let me now get started. All right. Well, first I want to thank all of you uh, in Hanover, uh, the board in particular, and Terry and his wife Mary uh, for uh, hosting me, taking care of me. Um, it is really a great honor to be asked by the Hanover Co-op to uh, be at your 75th anniversary celebration. So you really have a lot to celebrate, and I can see why you have uh, put so much effort into it. And the banner across the main street, and posters everywhere, and you've taken over the Baker Library. Um, and, and it's just wonderful, because you have such a great story to tell. And I really congratulate you on all of the things that you have achieved. I think that Hanover uh, needs to be reminded, because I think it's important that um, you have provided tremendous leadership, uh, both locally, regionally, and nationally, for almost all of that 75 years. I think I first came to Hanover to participate in activities in the 1980s, maybe, uh, maybe even the 70s. Um, because you then were already playing a, a national role. And so I want to thank you very much for that. Um, here you are, beginning in 1936 in the midst of the Depression, um, a small group uh, dedicated to the cooperative principles and determined to carry out the idea of a cooperative. In 1936 comes Toyohiko Kagawa. Um, he affected many, many people, but he certainly had an impact here. Um, well, who was this? Uh, who was this masked Japanese man? Um, you know, when you think about it, he was five foot two. Um, he was pretty much half blind almost all of his life because of his work with the beginning with the poor in, in, in uh, Kobe. Um, he was sickly most of his life. He was away from home most of his life. Um, but he did give everything that he had to the development of his dream of what he felt cooperatives could do for the world. Um, he wrote Brotherhood Economics, which was one of 150 books that he wrote during his lifetime. And I'm always saying to myself, how did he write 150 books when he was blinded one eye and had to read everything else with a huge magnifying glass. 
and, and, and how did he do it? But he did it. He used to get up at four in the morning, which is about an hour earlier than Terry gets up. Um, which I know. <laughs> and the dog is always awake. Um, <laughs> but we won't go into it. <laughs> but uh, his, uh, his um, uh, emphasis upon um, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself was um, just the core of the life that he led and what he, he tried to achieve. Um, his visits to, an Amer to America um, were numerous. He first came in 1914 uh, as a student to attend the Princeton Seminary School. Um, he came again in 1924 to raise money for the impact of the um, Tokyo earthquake, which killed 110,000 people at that time. He came again in 1935 and 1936. He came again in 1940 and um, He was frequently here, and uh, his 1936 tour was probably the, um, the major point of the impact that he had upon Americans because he gave talks to groups in a hundred different communities. Um, he spoke in person, there were I think 700,000 people who attended the meetings that he, he gave. And uh, on his departure from the United States, uh, he was able to address uh, NCB on a national broadcast, but of course were listened to, listened to by millions. So he had tremendous impact, uh, not only here in Hanover, uh, but in Berkeley and in Greenbelt, Maryland, in New York City, Washington, D.C., Berkeley, California, all sorts of places. Um, he, um, he was interested in all types of cooperatives, uh, partially because he was a very curious individual. But growing up in Japan, um, between the two world wars and then, of course, the, uh, the world war that uh, supposed to end all wars, um, he took an interest in how do we organize the poor, because they need to be organized, how do we organize the slum dwellers, how do we um, organize the buraku, which are the, the caste people in Japan. Uh, Japan has a caste system, and most people aren't aware of it. Um, and so there are the untouchables you know, in Japan, which he spent a great deal of time organizing. He organized a lot of farmers because he had a, a great interest in agronomy. And the Japanese farmers at that time owned no land. All of the land was owned by feudal lords, and it was leased out as kind of a sharecropper deal. Um, he organized the labor unions. He organized cooperatives for consumers, for insurance, for students. Um, he just was nonstop in the type of activities that he did. Uh, but there he was, uh, with all of that uh, going on, uh, came to the United States and spent about five months here in 1936. And you may have benefited from the fact that he was invited to give a lecture in Rochester uh, called the Rauschenberg Lectures, um, which were uh, published and broadcast and that kind of thing. So that was like the closest place I found uh, that gets mentioned to Hanover is that, and it seems to be about the same time, which was April of 1936. You know? um, I'm, going to I'm going to ask you a puzzling question, and then you can ask me the question at the end of it, but while he was here in Hanover, he did not shake hands with anyone. So if you want to know why, then that's a question you ask at the, uh, at the end of the, uh, the session. Um, 75 years later, um, you have a thriving cooperative, you have a thriving cooperative grouping uh, here in the Upper Valley um, through your neighborhood food co-op work, um, you are using your strength in numbers and in uh, consolidation to create more opportunities for cooperatives, more savings for cooperatives, more strength for cooperatives. So um, it's a very, very interesting era that Hanover is a part of at this present time. And it's exciting, you know, with the 
and with the running of the economy, you know, under question in so many ways, with the economy almost collapsing, two years ago, people are asking, well, what kind of economy should we have, and how do we build that alternative economy? And you're just a wonderful example with what you have done um, to give people faith and hope that these things, you know, can be done and things can be changed. Um, I thought of looking at Kagawa from the numbers angle. So, uh, so here's what I did. <clears throat> I went on Google and put in his name, and there were 54,000, what do you call it, hits? I don't know. Well, 54,000 places that, mention, that, that are mentioned on the net relating to Kagawa. Um, there were 150 books that he published. Um, there were 28 items about him for sale on eBay yesterday. Um, <laughs> he was arrested a dozen of times. He was twice nominated for the Nobel Prize for Literature and twice nominated for the Nobel Prize for the Peace Prize. Um, he was awarded a feast day in the Episcopalian liturgical calendar. And so last Saturday, April the 23rd, um, Episcopalians all around the world celebrated the feast day of Kavanaugh. Um, there is one stamp issued by the Micronesian Republic about him because of his work in Asia. Um, there's a street in California, in Los Angeles, named after him. It's actually not very far from where Schwarzenegger lives. I just don't know if he ever used that street. <laughs> it would, be, would have been good if he had. Um, there are three student housing cooperatives in the U.S. and Canada, named after him. And uh, he's the only Asian honored by a statue in the National Cathedral in Washington. Um, and so those, those are some of the numbers about him. Well, let's look at the numbers of what he did in Japan. What is present today? Today, this is just in the consumer cooperatives. Today, there are 25 million members of consumer cooperatives in Japan. Uh, they do $37 million of annual retail trade. <clears throat> they have $6.2 billion in share capital. And as many of my co-op friends know, I'm sort of Mr. Capital. Because um, I love that about these guys. The member has an average of $852 invested in their cooperative. So when you think about 30, sorry, 25 million members investing $852, you come up with 6.2 billion in share capital. So the Japanese cooperatives uh, don't have to borrow very much because they get most of it from their members. Um, those figures about the consumer cooperatives are just about that. If we were to look at the agricultural cooperatives, which are huge in Japan, if we were to look at the role of trade unions, if we were to look at the role of university cooperatives, health cooperatives, housing cooperatives, uh, the impact of Kagawa on all of that was, was terribly important. So what is it that we reap from his work? Well, he was tremendously concerned that cooperatives had to plan. And the Japanese co-op movement is full of plans. Five-year plans, three-year plans, revision of this plan and that plan. Um, they have plans and they keep to their plans. Not only that, um, but when you have a plan, you're talking about doing something, and when you do something, you need resources. And so along with the planning that they do, 
they always plan to have the resources from the members. So capitalizing the plan is a very critical part of what the cooperatives do in Japan. It's not a dream. It's a plan, and a plan costs money, and we have to come up with money, and if we come up with money, we make it happen, and then our plan is carried out. So the plans are very real to the Japanese, and uh, he played a big role in, in making that happen. Um, he also focused a lot on how you manage the cooperatives. Um, the first two cooperatives that he created both failed. <clears throat> and he was very interested in learning what went wrong, what didn't work, what didn't happen. You know, we all said this is what we wanted, we all said go ahead, you know. And they failed. So he was very interested in learning about how they failed. And part of what he felt was that one case, um, it, they failed because they, 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 they didn't manage their dream very well. They, their dream was there, but they didn't manage achieving that dream. And so he felt that you've got to have managers who know how to make a plan work, how to make the economics of the plan work, um, but how to make the cooperative work at the same time. But the co-op had to work for the dream to come true. And so therefore, there's a heavy emphasis upon management. And one of his disciples, Isao Takamura, wrote a wonderful book about managing cooperatives. And um, it, it's, uh, I don't know how easily you can get the book. I have a copy. Um, but it's fascinating to read it because of the emphasis he had on the management side of the cooperative. Yeah. Um, so that was part of what he did, too. Um, he also felt that cooperatives should learn from what others have done. A lot of us think of Kagawa as, uh, as a person who taught us a lot. But for the most part, when he was on his journeys, he was trying to learn as much from where he was and what those people were doing. And he wanted to capture the best ideas that were available to him and bring them back to Japan. And one of the most wonderful stories that I think about is that uh, in 1951, he, um, he, he formed the Japanese Consumer Cooperative Union at the end of the, uh, at the, end of the war. And uh, he said, you know, we need to send young people to the United States to learn about retailing because they are so much far ahead. We need to learn how it is they're doing it. And we need to learn how the cooperatives are doing it. He sent two young men. Both of them were sponsored by the Cooperative League of the USA, which is now NCBA. Um, their passages were paid because Japan and the cooperatives were terribly poor after the war. So American cooperatives cooperated, raised the money to pay for these two young men to come. And one worked for the Berkeley Co-op for six months, and one worked for the Palo Alto Co-op for six months. And both of those people later on became heads of the Japanese Consumer Cooperative Union and made a tremendous contribution both in Japan and throughout Asia, and then you know also to the international uh, grouping. But um, they wanted to learn. In total, before the, the Berkeley Co-op um, died in 1988, I think, um, the Japanese cooperatives had sent 2,000 managers to the United States to learn how retail operated in here. 2,000 managers. Um, so they, they, they have a strong commitment um, to learning uh, those things. Um, another legacy that I think is associated with capital in my mind is um, that he always understood that change was occurring. Uh, times changed, economies changed, people changed, lives changed, 
and for the cooperatives to have to remain vibrant and meaningful to their members, the cooperative had to know what change was coming, get ready for that change, prepare for that change, and be part of the change when it began to occur. Um, I'll give you a, a couple of examples. Um, interestingly enough, uh, the Japanese uh, Consumer Cooperatives Act, sort of 27 billion or 37 billion that I talked about, um, around about uh, almost a half of that is done through what is called their Han groups. So, um, um, around about 800,000, 800 million, eight billion, sorry, eight billion of those sales are done through group buying programs, not retail store sales, <clears throat> where a group of neighbors come together and then they do an order through a consumer thing and then a truck delivers that to the the ground floor of the apartment building where they live, and the members come down and they sort it all out and give it to each other and do what they do. They're, um, a third of the members of the Japanese, well, of the 25 million, are members of Han groups and have no relationship to the retail store. Um, about 10 years ago, the co-op noticed that people were dropping out of the Han groups because when they were originally done after the war, the women were not working. Neither were most of the men. <laughs> but the women were not working, and they had the time to do those hard groups. But as the economy changed and women went to work, then there were less women to participate in the hard groups. And so from, that, from 2006 to 2008, uh, one million people dropped out of the hard group category. But what the co-op found out, because they do a lot of surveys, was that the, um, uh, those people still wanted to have home delivery, but they couldn't do it in a group format, because they just were not available to be at the meetings and go to the, you know. So, uh, but they said they would have it if it were made it available individually. So the co-op changed all of its programs to allow for the individual purchasing of of, uh, of groceries. And now, 10 years ago, there was nothing. Last year, $8 billion was done by the cooperatives of Japan in individual home delivery. So I'm using that as a way of saying they were watching what happened and why they were losing volume. They found out what it was. They surveyed the members to find out could they do it some other way? They found another way to do it. The member wanted to do it. The co-op wanted to do it, and they rebuilt back their volume in the in the non-retail function. Um, another thing that they did is that they noticed that they had an aging population, and as a result, um, the members who were senior you know, we're having more difficulties getting to the store, so they put a great deal of emphasis upon um, how to deal with folks with disabilities. Um, they began a mechanism whereby members of the cooperatives who had time and were available to go shopping for the other members would do it voluntarily. They put together a whole program of, you know, that home delivery done by other members for um, disabled or senior members. Um, they changed a lot of what they did at their stores in terms of the programs that, that they did in terms of cooking and home health and other activities. And so they really uh, transformed. They hadn't done anything for seniors you know, prior to spotting this. But then when they spotted it, they decided that they needed to do that. <clears throat> what he also learned was that um, the farmers of Japan had to do something differently. So he went all around the world looking at what could be done. And for example, he came back from Germany with the idea that um, a cooperative bank for farmers was absolutely necessary because the small Japanese farmers 
you know, they had no collateral because they didn't own the land, and they had to borrow money for the different crops, and they were at the uh, at the risk of the of the money lenders. And having their own cooperative bank was going to be, you know, critical. That bank is now one of the largest banks in Japan. Um, he also found by being visiting cooperatives in Denmark that there the farmers had insurance programs because of you know crop risk and this and that and the other, and he brought that idea back to Japan and both the consumer cooperatives and the farmer cooperatives have tremendous insurance programs, which are some of the largest in the country. Um, after the war, um, he was invited to give advice to General MacArthur. And, you know, in life, it's always interesting who you meet and how you might actually meet them again somehow. Um, MacArthur hired one of Farmland Industries' top executives to run his program for farmers in the rebuilding of Japan. Well, Howard Cowden, who was the president of Farmland Industries, was a devotee of Kagawa. And when this fellow turned up from Farmland Industries on MacArthur's staff, Kagawa went to him right away and said, we have met before. You know Mr. Cowden, I know Mr. Cowden. And um, as a result, in the rebuilding of Japan, if you look at it very, very carefully, you will see that there was tremendous influence by Kagawa on what was done. Um, rebuilding the farmers' cooperatives was a priority. Um, land distribution in Japan was done under MacArthur so that the farmers could, for the first time, own their own piece of land, the land that they had farmed for hundreds of years. Um, the fishery cooperatives were rebuilt, the forestry cooperatives were rebuilt, because that, you know, a lot of the wood had been destroyed and being used up for fuel during the war. Um, but if you, if you look at what happened to the cooperatives in Japan, there is such a burst of activity um, when MacArthur came in. And I think it relates a lot to that relationship of Kagawa to Howard Cowan and to the American farmland cooperatives at the time as the largest farm cooperative in the United States. So you never know who you might meet again. I'll go back to a point I made earlier. Um, he really had um, a tremendous desire to learn why, when things went wrong, why had they gone wrong? And, um, and I, I'm very much in agreement with him on this because um, I am now an American. Um, I, I was one of the accursed oppressors, um, as I was described two days ago by Terry. <laughs> so maybe at least you came into your work. <laughs> But I was born in Hawaii. Um, <laughs> and, and you see the Hawaiian flag has that Union Jack in the corner. Mm -hmm. okay. um, but I, I worry, the one thing I worry about with Americans is that you generally don't like to look at what went wrong. You, you like to say, well, that's in the past, and let's not talk about that anymore. And the future is, you know, you know. I mean, you have a wonderful optimism, you know, but um, but optimism isn't going to be much use if you haven't learned from the last failure. You know, it just is. Uh, you know, it, it's a fine feeling, and I guess your endomorphins go up and all that. But, um, but your knowledge uh, doesn't get help. So. Um, he wanted to learn from the mistakes, what had gone wrong, um, how could we have done it differently, um, who could have done it differently, um, why did we mistakenly think that this was going to succeed when it, it didn't succeed. Um, and one of the examples for that is they had come over for 20 years 
and studying the Berkeley Co-op while they could learn from the Berkeley Co-op. But as soon as the Berkeley Co-op failed, Mr. Oya, who was one of those two guys who had come over to Berkeley in the 1950s, uh, called me up and said, David, Berkeley Co-op failed, right? And I said, yes, and regretfully so. He said, we must study. And I thought, God bless you. <laughs> <laughs> and they sent um, Twin Pines Corporate Foundation $10,000. And uh, we put together a group of people to write a book called Why the Berkeley Co-op Failed. And, um, and it's a really interesting book because it does document different people's explanations as to why the co-op failed. We felt that in writing it, we shouldn't take any one particular point of view. We, we felt that if we had like 12 different people write individually about what it was they thought, that would be a better contribution to the literature than, you know, sort of blaming these people or those people or whatever. So if you ever have a chance and you can get a copy of that, it, it is well worth it. But I thought, how interesting that the first thing they thought of is, we must study that failure. If we have studied Berkeley for 20 years because of its success, why wouldn't we study why it failed? You know? And, um, and so, I just, I just loved them that they stepped in and, uh, and did that. Also, after the Kobe earthquake, and I sent, I sent a copy to Terry to distribute to whoever would like it, but uh, after the Kobe earthquake, um, the Japanese corporate union did a study of, well, we know earthquakes happen in Japan. We make all of these efforts to avoid the impact of earthquakes, and yet this earthquake came and it had tremendous, you know, impact and you know just really harmed the different co-ops. So, what is it that we need to learn from what we didn't do relative to the Kobe earthquake? And they did a whole study, and so you know the interesting thing will now will be okay. Well, they did that study. You know, how much did that impact? You know, what happened in the Sendai province? So we'll see. And I expect that they will have another study, which is, well, you know, it helped that we did all of these things, but, uh, you know, we, uh, we, we still have more to learn, you know. So, um, so those are the things that, uh, that they get involved with. Um, Kagawa, for me, uh, was a very complex man. I'm, I'm not a philosopher or, you know, somebody who can kind of talk about what it is that, that he was or wasn't. Um, he, you know, for a period of time, he really was, was truly a pacifist, and then he said he was no longer a pacifist. Um, he um, wanted a world federal government, but then became somewhat entrapped in the nationalism of, uh, of Japan when the war broke out. Um, I think he had a lot of conflicting opinions about, you know, anti-colonialism, different things like that. Um, he critiqued both communism and capitalism. Um, he, uh, he was uh, never afraid most of the times to use his voice, although he was definitely silenced in Japan uh, during the war. He was arrested any time that he made any kind of a statement that, that had any sense of appeasement or you know, peace searching or whatever, and the, the authorities would, would arrest him and put him in there. Um, but, um, what I think that we reap from him is this tremendous uh, interest in planning. Um, the structure of organizations was of concern to him. Uh, how the plan was carried out, how the capital plan uh, worked. Um, did they have the capacity? How could they have the capacity? How do they grow the management capacity? Um, what do we have as a result of what he did in Japan? Well, we have the world's strongest cooperative movement in Japan. When you add up the consumer, the farmer, and fishery, forestry, health, housing, insurance, and banking, you have the largest block of cooperative success in the world. 
they have shared all of their success uh, with the rest of Asia, with the Philippines, with Indonesia, with China, um, places like that. And so, if you look at the map of cooperatives of the ICA, um, it was Eurocentric until the Second World War. But now, the ICA, the bulk of the membership, the bulk of the economic volume and activity is now in Asia as a continent versus where it had once been, uh, Europe. And I would say that it was the work of uh, Kagawa and uh, all of his efforts um, that made Japan the fulcrum of the development of cooperatives in Asia. The Japanese also play a very important role in the ICA. They are leaders in the consumer committee, the fisheries committee, the uh, agricultural committee, and uh, education and technology and other work, other places like that. What's the ICA? Oh, the ICA, sorry, thank you. It's the International Cooperative Alliance, um, which now, now that you, you sort of mentioned that, well then, thank you. Um, 2012 is going to be the International Year of Cooperatives as uh, defined by the United Nations. We're having the second time in the United Nations history that cooperatives are going to be the, the focus of that particular year. And um, to some extent, I would say that the Japanese played a big role in helping to make that happen because they have a, a fairly major presence um, through different bodies uh, into, the, uh, into the United Nations. Um, in 1951, uh, Kagawa wanted the slogan of the Japanese cooperatives to be for peace and a better life. And that still is their slogan. And it still is very, very meaningful to them that the cooperative is at the heart of creating a society that will bring a better life uh, to the members. And that is what they're always trying to pursue. And I think that that was really uh, you know, an important thing that they brought to us. I was going to, I'm getting near to the close here, but I was going to um, go to page 194 in my little book here. Hang on, that's Oh, and the other thing I was thinking about um, is, his wife, of course, I feel so terribly sorry for her because he was hardly ever around. Um, but she was as committed to these things as he was. Um, her name was Haru, and Haru in Japan means spring. And I thought, well, I should mention her because it is spring. And, um, and I don't want to necessarily leave her out because she brought up, you know, the four children. Um, and uh, anybody who wants to see it, I could show you this book later, but it is it is signed by all four of Kagawa's children. Um, so, page 194. Um, in the Rauschenbusch lectures, Kagawa expanded on the points he had been making throughout the tour, calling for cooperatives in seven areas of society so that an entire system of cooperative enterprise would embrace the economy. The seven were insurance, producers, marketing, credit, mutual aid, utilities, and consumer. So those were the, the groups that he was uh, wanting to see us do work on. And then, on page 196, um, this was part of his farewell uh, speech in 1936 uh, on NBC. Um, up until August of 1941, uh, Kagawa was still doing everything he could to stop what everybody saw as the war that was about to occur with Japan. Um, he came across to the United States. Um, he and a number of other Christian leaders from Japan met with Christian leaders of the Mission Inn in, San, uh, in Riverside, California. 
and they had a conference, and they were making phone calls to Roosevelt through the Japanese ambassador, who was, was, was somewhat influenced by uh, Kagawa uh, still at that time. Um, up until the last minute, but of course, you know, it, it didn't happen, and that terrible war then occurred. Um, so his final message uh, before departing for Europe um, from the United States was broadcast over NBC. It was full of hope, and he urged international cooperation in trade and praising the U.S. willingness to grant independence to the Philippines is one of the greatest achievements in American history that has happened in the Orient. And he closed with, I have learned to love the American people. You have a wonderful future. I ask your prayers for the maintenance of peace between this country and Japan. I bid farewell to you, and I pray God's blessings upon you. And so those were the last words before that war came about. I'm sure that in 1936, when he spoke in that beautiful white New England chapel, is that the United Church of Christ? Yeah. Um, thank you. Um, I'm sure that he probably said many of those same words uh, in talking uh, to the people who came to attend that talk. Um, everybody knew that war was likely with Japan. Um, and yet, he then met with a small group of people, and um, what on the board I read as the Hanover cons consumers. <laughs> there was a typing error in the in the minutes of the meeting, so it was actually the Hanover con consumers, not consumers club. Um, but I'm sure when he met with that group and talked about um, what it was that cooperatives could achieve, um, at the back of many of those people's minds is, yes, we can do this, but regretfully, at some point soon, we're, we're going to have this thing to deal with. But what can we do? Well, we can only start in our community. We can only start locally. We can only change what we individually do with our, our brethren, and we can build you know, brotherhood in economics here. Um, so I will just close by saying that um, I too have loved and learned to love the American people. And you do have a wonderful picture, but you must plan, you must sow, and if you do that, we will reap. And Hanover has done a great job of leading a lot of these efforts. Uh, here locally and regionally and nationally. And it is a part of the makeup of you and your organization. And I'm proud to be here and to be um, encouraged to speak uh, today. And I want to say in all honor and all humbleness and in all gratitude, Hanover Call, congratulations on your 75th anniversary Thank you from the rest of us for what you have done. Thank you very much. I, I think one of the things I share with him he, that it is that he is very impatient. And I'm very impatient because I want, I really want the world to change and I want there to be more cooperatives and, and I know that there is a lot more things that everybody can do to make that happen. So I would ask Kagawa, how, 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 did, you, how did you work out these, this difference between what you hope to achieve and what people actually were willing to do? And how can you get people to do more when we know that they need to do more? Because if we don't make any change, we won't have that change, you know. So that, that would be, thank you very much for that question, Alan. But I, I, I don't want to be patient. I don't want to learn how to be patient. Um, but I want to learn how to make that happen. Thank you. This is uh, less of a question than a comment, because I didn't realize until your talk that uh, Pagala had indirectly caused our shared most embarrassing moment. <laughs> <laughs> and it has to do with planning. 
Because about 15 years ago, David and Kate and I were all involved in the International Cooperative Alliance movement, and we would get together every year in some different city around the world for this annual meeting. But it was full of really old people that would form the working groups. It was the agricultural working group and the fishing working group and the women's working group, and we were young at the time. So about 15 of us at those meetings, we would we would go to a little beer joint, like in Budapest, and we would call ourselves the non-working group. You know, as a parent, we really did. And so every year, it was the most fun part of those meetings. And David, Kate, and I, and about 15 others, and we get together. Well, one year the meeting was in Spain, in Madrid, and we put up a sign for the first time. You know, right into the, the banking working group and the fishing working group, we put up the non working group, we're meeting Suite 716. And so the 15 of us came and we had the best time, we laughed at all those other people. This is the non working group, stuff like that. Well, the next year it was going to be in Tokyo, and we noticed that whole time that there were these people. The planning part of Kagawa was right there because they were just planning this meeting in Tokyo. And you could just see them taking notes. And just so they just took note of everything that was happening in Madrid. Well, we ended up in Tokyo. And the first night, each of the working groups is usually sponsored by one of the big co ops in the host country. And imagine our chagrin when we saw. On the bulletin board, that bank that the government started, Nurmjuka Bank, is the seventh largest bank in the world right now, was posting the non working <laughs> at the top, at the highest. You know, <laughs> so I didn't realize that the government had actually caused that, you know, I'm not, I'm not sure what we said, but it was my speech. But anyway, thank you for clearing up. Oh, well, thank you, Bob. <laughs> Um, I, I have an actual question. <laughs> uh, thank you, Don. But, but I'm I proceeded uh, by thanking you, David, for coming to Hanover. I, I worry sometimes that my neighbors here in the Upper Valley don't realize what a, a monumental piece of the cooperative firmament our co-op is. And I, I mention that now because it's not every co-op in the country that we get David Thompson to come flying across four time zones to speak at that co-op's annual meeting. So, your willingness to do that is uh, something that's very much appreciated in this community, and we also appreciate your acknowledgement of what a valuable and important co-op we have. Uh, I've actually read Brotherhood Economics. I have a copy of it. And my, I have two questions that sort of arise out of that reading. One is, in a way, I was kind of disappointed by reading the book because it seemed to me to be very much of its time. It, it didn't seem to have a lot of timeless literary merit. I, I know that Kagawa is often uh, compared to people like Reinhold Niebuhr, and yet it seems like Niebuhr's writing at least is more memorable and noteworthy today than Brotherhood Economics is. And so I wonder if you would recommend any of the 150 books that Kagawa wrote uh, with regard to its enduring merit as literature. And my second question has to do with maybe a slight disagreement with your assertion that what's memorable to us today about Kagawa is his emphasis on planning. What, what I took from my reading of Kagawa was uh, that he made a connection that we should consider continuing to make, which is between what we're doing as uh, people engaged in economic activity and what people of religious faith are doing, which is really trying to build an economy that is based on love rather than greed. And so my other question is really, it has to do with the fact that uh, in a community where our consumers club and ultimately our co-op was started by uh, a religious figure, Roy Chamberlain, and where a seminal moment was the appearance in this, in this community of a religious theologian from Japan, should we be doing more as cooperators to make clear our, our religious roots and our presence as a form of economic activity that has religious significance? Mm. Well, thank you, Don. That's it. Excellent two questions there. Um, well, first I would start off by saying that um, in many ways, 
I, I, I don't think of um, uh, Kagawa as a, a writer where you can pull out many, you know, quotations or things that you think about, you know. Um, I, I often think of him, I compare him a little bit to um, uh, um, Don Jose Maria Arasmendi Reta, who started the, the Mondragon Cooperative in Spain, who was a Catholic priest. Because when you go through his writings, like every page there's a quote, you know, oh, you know, that's a good one, you know. Um, so I think that Kagawa was trying to educate people about things that he was a part of, the things he was doing at the time. Um, he did it well um, as a describer of things, but I don't think, I don't think of him, uh, as you're saying, as a, as a philosopher where you can just sort of deeply say any of these things. Um, he did have a lot of impact upon all of those people, Niebauer, you know, a lot of the, the German philosophers that, that were involved, and a lot of the people that affected Martin Luther King, and he, he affected those people, but only by, more by what he did than what he wrote, you know. So, I'm just always glad that he, he did write. Um, the book that I enjoyed most was Grains of Wheat. Um, I've read about 12 of them, they're not all translated into English, you know. Um, but mainly in Songs of the Slums is a, a beautiful set of poetry uh, about, uh, about the, the life of the slum dwellers. So that part I would, I would talk about. Um, in terms of the, um, the, the relationship with the church, um, you know, I think that your question is, is a very propitious one um, because we, we, we appear to have let's say the old line churches who um, who have gone into a lot of social work and, and now this is sort of where I where I step in with a challenge um, I always worry uh, uh, let me put it I'll just start off by saying this I dislike charity and the reason why I dislike charity is because I feel it takes away from the individual through cooperatives doing the things that they could achieve together. And I hate the fact that, you know, we've set up a society where we now think, well, if we do charity, then that sort of covers the poor. And, and I just think that that's, you know, debilitating. Um, and I think that the churches of have gotten too involved in charity um, rather than self-help. And um, so I think it is an appropriate time to perhaps begin to challenge the ecumenical community uh, to think a little differently about, you know, housing and work and welfare and health and things like that and, and try to find the ways to put folks like that in control of their own um, relationship. Um, Urban is here, and Urban knows that uh, in, um, in Emilio Mata, um, a large percentage of the social services of the state have now been taken over by cooperatives. And the people who are you know, in a mental health program are now a member of a mental health cooperative and they're on the board of directors and they're now making decisions about how the mental health programs work. And there's been a real change in the social services of India as a result of it. So that again is sort of like, let's stop doing the charity angle, let's figure out how to do the self-help. Um, yes, indeed, I think we should, you know, challenge the churches to be more involved and my concern for a lot of the evangelical churches is that they don't have a sense of community, they don't have a sense of what should be done for others, only for their own members. And that is, you know, creating a problem, especially in Latin America, where the Catholic Church was and is very involved in reaching out to those in need without saying who they are, just giving them the help that they need. And the Catholic Church has been actually tremendous, you know, when it comes to cooperatives. So there's a lot that needs to be done in that area, but a very, very good topic to bring up. Thank you. 
Uh, so I want to congratulate Hanover for 75 years. I'm Jamie Comtois from uh, the Manana Community Market. We're opening a food co-op next year in Keene, New Hampshire. Um, I'm really excited. Our uh, project manager, Bonnie Husbeth, is um, here as well. And uh, my question, listening to the, the real study of the cooperative movement throughout history, uh, one of the things that struck me was that um, there has been a study of the regional impact, regional economic impact of food co-ops on um, the local producer community. And I think it was in 2007, about $33 million of, of goods were purchased from local producers. And one of the questions that I had is, is there a demonstration of what is the optimum size for a group of organized people uh, in a cooperative fashion? Because one of the things that strikes me as cooperative movements grow is that when you get into the billions of sales or you get into the billions of millions of members, uh, do you start to sacrifice the very principles of self-organization uh, that cooperatives were actually built upon. Uh, because I've heard in some organizational theory that the optimum size for a group of people to come together is 250 people. And I remember thinking to myself as I started hearing some of these wonderful numbers that frankly give me goosebumps, give me goosebumps and make me think, oh, we're doing it, we're building the alternative economy. Um, if in that process we notice that there is a sacrifice of the principles themselves because the size in some way uh, answers or points out how possible it is to actually follow through with the principles. Oh boy. <laughs> is that a question? <laughs> I just wanted you to answer that. <laughs> well, thank you. And uh, I'm keen to join your co op <laughs> Um, you know, that's, that, 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 that's a, um, it's a great question because I, I don't necessarily always have the answer to that question. I think my biggest fear is if, if we haven't figured out how to be a player uh, in the world, then it's going to be a world of Walmarts. And I fear a world of war wants more than I fear a world of large cops. <laughs> <laughs> so it just depends on what you fear. You know. <laughs> um, yes, you know, it, certainly as organizations get larger, a lot of the elements of that small group mechanism, you know, do go away. Um, what I generally suggest is for people, and probably that might mean yourself and, and your group, where you, you want to be small and you want small to have um, meaning you know, to yourself, then the duty that you have is to, is to make sure that the system that you set up is going to be strong and capable and powerful but if you don't want it to be a one cooperative with 100,000 members, then your job is to create a thousand cooperatives with you know, 100 members or however that works out. Right? Um, because what I worry about is how many more people every day are going into Walmarts? You know, we in the cooperative sector are having a smaller portion of the market share every day. Our share gets smaller. And so I really don't have a concern how a Hanover might organically grow in its area, or how the Calgary co-op grows in its area, or the Mondragon cooperative, or whatever. Yeah, I may have some uh, qualms about, you know, the democracy isn't as easy, you know, I can't talk to the board members and all of those things, but I, I want there to be a bulwark against, you know, the multinational corporations, you know, which to me are, you know, decreasing the way in which this earth, you know, is going to be able to exist. 
And, um, and I think we, we do have to have um, a competitor uh, to that, and that may mean that the competitor has to be a large cooperative, you know, with different end results by what it does with the money that it creates and what a Walmart does. So we probably have a difference, but um, let's let's race to the top of all of this. You know, you race with the smaller co-ops, and I can race with the bigger co-ops, and let's do our best in every way possible to make this a better world, and let's keep our eye on Walmart because they're the ones who are, you know, harming this planet um, for for the rest of our lives. So thank you. <coughs> One thing that we can do as individuals and one thing we can do as co-ops to optimize the legacy impact of the International Year of Cooperatives. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's a good one. Well, thank you. Um, well, I, 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 think, um, I think one of them is to educate the public about the role of cooperatives. Um, getting information out. Um, you know, you have a lot of wonderful stuff that you've begun to develop here that talks about all of the cooperatives in the, in the region. Um, but one of them is to, you know, educate the public about what role cooperatives play and try and get people to move their their dollars, you know, over here. My, my dad on his dying bed, you know, said, you know, I, I was four, you know, we had, you know, two pounds in the co-op. But the co-op gave me a job, you know, the co-op gave me insurance, the co-op gave me, um, you know, better quality food, etc., etc. Um, I think that it could be an era in which organizations say, in honor of the International Year of Cooperatives, we want to commit to making this particular thing happen. I think that each cooperative organization for the International Year of Cooperatives so should stretch themselves, you know, in certain directions, you know, just try a little harder, you know, try to be more effective at doing this, um, look at how much volume that you're doing with non-cooperatives that you could put into cooperatives. I mean, if we all sort of shifted a little bit of what we're doing, we would strengthen our whole, you know, by doing that. You know, put your money into a credit union if you have it in a bank at the present time, you know, shop at the co-op, you know, you know, drink as much equal exchange coffee as your doctor will let you. <laughs> you know, those, uh, those kinds of things. I think that we should, um, you know, we should look for some goals at a national level that we can achieve. Um, and I, I'm always wanting to say, you know, um, a lot of our cooperatives don't get to achieve what they would like to because they lack the capital. And we have mechanisms for them to have capital. And we all have capital. We all have money in our pockets. We all have money in banks and credit unions. You know, we could shift some of that into cooperative development organizations. We would conquer, you know, that, uh, that problem pretty quickly. And so, you know, we can, we can buy change, you know, with, uh, with the money that we have in our pockets. But there's much more, and I think at the local and regional level, people need to figure out what it is they want to achieve and uh, help and go make that happen. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah. Thanks, David. Um, just a, a couple quick questions. You touched on them a little bit, but the, the first one I wanted to ask was, um, you know, leadership in the cooperative community is a, is a unique form of leadership. And Kagawa was clearly a leader, but I think we miss something by not understanding how he was able to inspire so many leaders. And I wonder if you have thoughts about that in terms of just how he, he was clearly able to inspire so many people in Japan and around the world. And the other is, is um, what's always been exciting to me about the cooperative movement is the application of cooperation uh, across the economy and across our lives. And I feel like one of the things we've been missing in the United States is this cross-sector cooperation, collaboration, thinking about different ways to apply the model. And clearly, Kagawa had some sense of this. And I'm, I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit more about how he was able to make the case for cooperation just across the economy in Japan. What, what were the key uh, aspects of that argument? Mm -hmm. OK, thank you, Orban. Urban is the executive director of the new, 
uh, the neighborhood food cooperative association, right? So a lot of you know what I've talked about here today, and uh, you know Urban and, and that group are uh, are in charge of making happen. Well, um, um, uh, I, I get asked a lot of questions. Uh, <laughs> You know, at these meetings, so um, so it's a, it's a penalty that I pay. Um, uh, you have to kind of remember, I, I left home at 15 and I left school at 15, um, and I've had a sort of a, a colorful life. Um, <laughs> um, so so I, I I'm probably not as bright as as people think. But I have an English accent, and, um, and, and that kind of, you know, people think, well, I have an English accent, so I get to Oxford, Cambridge, you know. I mean, there's all sorts of stuff that I know we're being filmed. Um, <laughs> that comes with having an English accent, you know, and, and so you give me far too much credit. Um, so I will try, Urban, to answer your question um, about inspiration. Um, I, I think, how could you not help be but inspired by a guy who didn't care any, about anything else except cooperatives? <laughs> he didn't care how he got work, how he ate, when he ate. He didn't care that he got blind. He didn't care that he got ill. He didn't care that he was worn out. You know, he just wanted to do co-op. So it, really kind of not difficult to figure out. I'm going to be inspired by that guy because uh, at the end of this speech he's going someplace else and I'm going home, you know. Um, but, um, so, so there's that part to it because there was such a selfless, you know, element in him. And, you know, one of the, one of the wonderful two or three pages, uh, you know, in this book that's outside for $30. Um, <laughs> There is a conversation between he and Gandhi, you know, and you look at that conversation and you you have to keep reading it to go to the deeper meaning of Gandhi said, well, what if this? And then, you know, because they were, they had, an, they had an interesting, basically an argument. Gandhi wanted to know why Kandawa wasn't willing to die for his ideals, right? And Kandawa said, I don't want to die for my ideals. I, I want to work for them, you know. And Gandhi's saying, well, you know, you, you give up a lot when you're not willing to die for them. <laughs> um, so you, you read that conversation and you think about it, you know, you sort of try to apply it to yourself. Well, it doesn't really apply to yourself because you're not going to die for anything and you're not going to work your whole life for anything like these guys did, you know. But it does make you ask that question. You say, well, how much will you work? And how much are you willing to give up, and you know that kind of a thing. So I think, in many ways, part of the inspiration was that he gave everything um, to this idea. He knew how to talk about it. He knew how to, you know, share it with people. Um, he could show by what he did himself that he was, you know. I figured, like, you know, if he came into the into, into the Hanover Co-op and notice some guy struggling with a box coming out of the out of the cellar, he'd probably go over and help him with the box. You know, does that that's the kind of guy he would be. Um, he educated himself a lot because inspiration I think in many ways comes from knowledge and background and being able to do that. I think that um, like I'm able to do, which is to go around, you know, America and parts of the world and talk about cooperatives. I'm able to share the experiences of some people over here who are humble and doing something really important and, and, and then tell people over here about that, what is happening. And then somebody has more faith because a lot of people, when they first come to a meeting about how to organize a co-op, they usually don't know anything about cooperatives. And, and they're, they're full of um, fear um, about what is going to happen and what it is that they're being asked to do, and they really don't think that they should be doing it. And, you know, but then they find out in those meetings, well, 
people in the next town did it, and those people over there did it, and, and then suddenly, you know, hope begins to come to people who were deflated and thought that they had no options, and suddenly now they have options and opportunities, and they can make it happen. So I, I think that's also part of it. The inspiration that he was able to do is provide that information, share it about what other people were doing in other places, and then people would feel, well, you know, what the hell? Yeah, those people can do it. I can do that, you know. So, um, so a lot of it has to do with just sort of changing the way people are. Now, let me see, that was one question. Um, so the next question was sort of the application. Well, I think I would just go back to um, the, um, if you, if you, if you, you can go online and you can easily find information about the Japanese Consumer Cooperative Union. They have a, an English part of their website. Um, you could probably do the same for the, um, the agricultural cooperatives. Um, but if you go and look at their stuff, you can see you can see the structures of the organization, which is online. You can see um, the annual reports. You can see how they um, how they talk about all of the things that they're doing in Asia. Um, there's there's a, a plethora of information that. that um, is, is really available to, um, to to give you the background on what it is they have set up, the structure that they have set up, and how they built into that structure. Um, so there are things that we can learn. I mean, I forget who we were talking with this morning about the fact that you know um, I think it was Don. You know, um, you know that we have uh, we have some laws, and somebody else came in and tried to do some different laws and about cooperatives and, and that was you know well thought up by the people here. Um, but maybe we need to look at strengthening those laws. Maybe we need to learn from the Italian cooperatives who have all of their cooperatives uh, under law are required to set aside 3% of their net earnings every year for the development of other cooperatives. You know, what a, what a wonderful thing to, to make happen. Um, so those, you know, what we need to do is not just look at what they have done, but how did they structure how that got done? You know, a lot of you know about CSAs, right? Community Supported Agriculture. Well, that was begun, that concept was begun by a co-op in Japan. You know, if, if you look at how did that happen, it was done by Seikatsu Club, which is a, a very, very um, thriving uh, cooperative in Japan who organized this relationship between the farmers and the consumers and created that first CSA. So, you know, they've done things that we know about that we didn't realize that they're responsible for. All right, well, I should probably take one last question, this lady here, or maybe just one more. <laughs> <laughs> okay, this is, this is a nice, simple question. Oh, thank you. Why do you think I want? Shake hands with anyone in Hanum. Oh! <laughs> well, that's a good one. Thank you for asking that. Um. <laughs> well, in fact, he actually didn't shake hands with anybody in America in 1937. Did this sound off? Sounds like. <laughs> feels like a sound wave. You did? Oh, you can hear me? You did cut out, but talk loud and I'll try to face it. Okay. <laughs> um, Kagawa arrived on a Japanese ship in the San Francisco Bay in uh, December of 1935. Um, the ship was delayed because of a storm. And uh, when uh, Kagawa was um, being um, processed on board the ship, um, he had to ask a series of questions. And um, one of the answers that he had to provide to one of the questions was, is that he had, is it trachoma? What is that? It's an eye disease. Uh, uh, no, it's not. I don't think it's yeast. Oh. Well, anyhow, he had a disease of the eyes, and it was contagious. 
And um, the, uh, the officer um, required uh, Kagawa to be then taken to Angel Island, which is kind of like the Ellis Island of San Francisco. And uh, he was to remain there to be shipped back to Japan because he wasn't going to be allowed to, uh, to come to America with that contagious disease. Um, Eleanor Roosevelt, uh, through um, Perkins, who was the uh, Secretary of Labor under Roosevelt, um, they went to the President and they said, you know, Canal has all of these meetings, a hundred set up in the United States, and we have to let him in. And, uh, sorry, Roosevelt said, well, but, you know, what do the regulations say? And the regulations say you can't cut, you know. And um, they worked out a deal um, which, which took the Secretary of State, President Roosevelt, Helen Roosevelt, and everybody else, which was that Kagawa could come into the United States, but he could only be here if he was accompanied by a doctor or a nurse every time, and that everything that he touched had to be sterilized and washed, and he was not allowed to shake hands with anybody in America. <laughs> Thank you. And to think I was on the edge of my seat for an hour and a half to get that explanation. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I'd like to first congratulate the, the Hanover Quaker Stores for their 75th year. Really a wonderful thing. I, I'm a member of the Greenfield Market, also known as the Franklin Community Co-op. I'm here one, with one of the general managers, someone on our board is here also. Thank you for, for the work you've done. Thank you, David, for coming to the East Coast. Uh, my question is in reference to one that, uh, something that you brought up earlier uh, at the end of your, your talk. And it has to do with if we're facing the ascent of very large, powerful multinationals, I guess, led the way by Walmart, as many of us probably know, uh, has about 24% of the retail food share currently in the United States. And if the co-ops are a shrinking share, less than 1%, and if education is what we consider to be the key to convince the public towards the goal of expanding the cooperative model, then what would you say are the key components of an educational program aimed at the public? And at the public, I would also include co-op members, because I think a lot of membership don't know really the, the principles or the foundation or the history of the cooperative model. They have a vague notion. I think I'm right when I say that. But uh, if you could just give me sort of you know, a, a public campaign. Uh, <laughs> you know, the, the, the talking points or the highlights of what you would consider would, you would want to see communicated to uh, millions of Americans. Well, you think I'm right on the nerve of things. <laughs> um, well, you're, you're definitely asking the right question. Um, because if we look at it statistically, food cooperatives are losing market share. Um, and, um, and, and that, you know, is not a good thing. Um, we are, you know, cooperatives individually are doing well, and many of them are, you know, making the changes that are necessary to be better in the future. Um, I think, for example, the creation of the National Cooperative Grocers Association was a seminal event in, um, in, in the development of the new wave of cooperatives to put a, a structure you know, to that organization and to provide buying power. Um, but you know, the individual cooperatives, in my mind, all themselves really need to be doing more to bring more members in, to tell more people about cooperatives, to attract more people to come in, but to grow the cooperative sector in our own locality and our own hometown, uh, so that we bring more volume to the NCGA, which then gets more uh, discounts and sends more money back so that we have more money to capitalize the growth that we need. A lot of people want to be a part of cooperative, but as it stands, 
they can only be part of the cooperative if there's a cooperative near them. And for a lot of our cooperatives, they, they, they shun the idea of going into an area where people might be willing to join the cooperative, but you know, um, the co-op doesn't want to leave its home base. Um, I'm getting a little off the subject, I know. Um, but I mean that is the challenge that we face. If we if we if we if we don't want to have a lot of people join cooperatives, and we really don't have to have much of a campaign <laughs> about educating the public. But I think that we first have got to change our attitude about who we want to take the co-op message to. That to me is a critical. I want more people to be in cooperatives. Um, I want more people to be in credit unions. I want more people to be in, you know. So, because I, I want us to have a bigger piece of the economy. I want us to have a, a bigger voice in the economy. I want us to have more impact. Um, so how do we do that? Well, I think it really starts with us. We've got to have a model that has the capacity to take advantage of the opportunities in the marketplace. And I don't think that most of the food cooperatives at this moment in time are really committed to doing much in that direction. And if we don't change that, there really isn't reason to have a campaign. If we want to change the way in which we want to expand the cooperative sector, we've got to change a lot of the ways in which we presently do business. So that's the first challenge, is really our own selves. <coughs> what would you say would be the most salient point you would make to the public to join and be part of a cooperative? Well, I think, um, I think there are a number of areas. I mean, one of them I would point out is that, you know, we are very local. You know, when, um, you know, I always, I always think about, um, I use this sort of measurement, I'm, I live in Davis, you know, my wife is the founder of the Davis Food Co-op. Um, so there's a Davis Food Co-op, and we employ about 170 people. And there's a Safeway on the other side of town that does about the same volume, probably a little bit more. And there's only 60 people working over there. And so I say to people, look, by shopping at the co-op, as we have collectively doing all of the things, we, we've created this 100 plus jobs. Well, over at Safeway, you shop there, you haven't created any jobs. There's no you know, human resources person over there. There's no you know, financial officer. There's no um, you know, marketing manager or anything like that. Those jobs are all somewhere else. So when we are shopping at Safeway, we're not creating jobs. We're not doing anything about that. Um, the Davis Food Co-op has its accounting done by a regional firm. You know, all of the accounting at Safeway is done by a national firm that I have no idea where they are. Um, the money at Davis goes into a local bank. Um, Safeway's money all goes to Oakland overnight and then goes to somewhere else. Um, now, you don't have much time to talk to people about things, but we are going to have to find a better way of explaining to people, when you spend that one dollar at the co-op, here are all of the things that happen with that dollar. And if you put that dollar into Walmart, here's where that money goes. And we need to, um, you know, we just need to figure out how to, how to make that sound better. Um, Michael Schumann's book, Going Local, I think uh, has been a really good help to you know, talk about that. I think there are other books coming out. The film that you're about to make uh, will help you know, sort of do that explanation. Um, so anyhow, yeah, that's... Thank you. Yeah, I'm sure. sure. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, we should bring it to an end here for my sake. <laughs> <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.